Hello and welcome to another episode of Knowledge Enthusiast Reacts, this time with Geography's now, Geography Now's uh, episode about Germany, because I am German and uh, I thought this would be um, a nice start into that series. I might react to um, other videos of them in the future. Um, yeah. Um, short to me because um, you might be uh, new around here uh, my name is Ossi Eastbourne I'm 31 years old I'm from East Germany but I was uh, raised in Hamburg and I live in Hamburg now um, I only lived the first three four years in, in uh, Saxony um, I'm a former history student without degree and a former um, video game journalist. So I have some knowledge about history and I have some knowledge about video games. Um, I am a big fan of gathering knowledge, uh, which also has its downsides because um, um, on the, while I have a pretty good memory and um, can memorize a lot of things I can often memorize it wrong yeah I'm continuing my quest to uh, gather knowledge and to maybe share knowledge with you and um, if you'd like the format uh, please like and subscribe you will also find of course a link to the video in the description to the original video I mean um, and without further ado because I talk too much uh, let's just start with geography now Germany. All right. Leader Hosen Schnitzel beer, bratwurst order bread and beer, complicated history beer, no humor, EDM and gummy bears that will kind of like give you diarrhea, but it's like worth it. I never had diarrhea from um, Harry Bow gummy gear bears. And yes, that's the most cliches um, about Germany, which um, funnily, the most cliches you might know about uh, Germans in Germany um are in fact only referring to bavarians because that's the part the um that's yeah when after the second world war germany was occupied by the british the french the soviets and the americans and the americans had uh, the uh, bavaria and uh, baden württemberg i think it was um so all the germans they had contact with were also from that area so the whole culture they had contact with was from that area um, and that's why when you see a depiction of Germans like in US media it's almost always uh, if it's uh, um, in, in cliche um, then it's with leather hose and, and, and stuff like that so that's the things he just wanted to get out of the way I think but yeah, beer is very famous. We're one of the um, largest beer consuming uh, countries in the world and um, a lot of our exports are beer related or car related, I guess. Beer, no humor, EDM and... And I don't know where that no humor comes from. That's uh, something I always wondered, even with a South Park episode about the, 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 the German funny bot. Um, I don't know. I, I, I've never come across um, this cliche before um, that South Park episode. And now I'm, I'm, I'm seeing it everywhere. Why, why, please explain me in the comments. Why do you think, uh, where, where does it come from that you think that Germans have no humor? Because we have. Hosen schnitzel beer, bratwurst order bread and beer, complicated history beer, no humor, EDM and gummy bears that will kind of like give you diarrhea, but it's like worth it. Ugh, those are such horrible stereotypes that every German is so sick and tired of hearing. True. One gummy bear? It's time to learn geography now! Hey everyone, I'm your host Barbie. So we've conquered Belgium's castle, jumped through Denmark's lagoon, danced through France's forest, and now we've made it to the final boss of the EU, Kingpin Germany. Level one. Begin. Ah, you know why I'm smiling. Yep, Germany has a lot of territorial anomalies. We'll get into that in a little bit, but first, Germany is located in central Western Europe, bordered by nine other countries, don't forget little Luxembourg, with small coasts on the North and Baltic Seas, which they own about 50 small islands. Now, Germany, like the US, is a federal republic, which has 16 smaller states, or Bundesland, each with its own constitution, three of which are cities, the capital Berlin, Hamburg, and Bremen, which is actually kind of like two cities, including Bremerhaven on the coast, but they kind of act like one entity Pfft. fun side which is true um 
Bremerhaven is, um, if I remember correctly, was given in exchange because Bremen had no access to to the sea, and um, I don't I don't remember if Bremerhaven or Cuxhaven was previously owned by Hamburg, and then changed for something else. It was something like that, but. Um, yeah, Bremerhaven and Bremen are seen as a city-state and one um, of those 16 Bundesländer. Um, the most populated one is um, North Rhine-Westphalia, where you find all the uh, industrial centers um, of, of um, Germany with um, the uh, Rhein-Ruhr um, areas and the Ruhrgebiet and um, all that stuff where Cologne is, where Düsseldorf is, where Essen is, where um, Dortmund is. Uh, all those big uh, football clubs are there ex except those that are not there like uh, Bayern München and um, Red Bull Leipzig. Not Red Bull Leipzig, it's RB Leipzig and um, yeah and uh, yeah, Hamburg has the biggest port in, in uh, Germany and the most important port in, in, in Germany, one of the biggest ports in uh, Europe as well. Um, and uh, I, I just forget why I even paused. <laughs> um, oh yeah, because uh, Bremerhaven and Bremen. Two cities, including Bremerhaven on the coast, but they kind of act like one entity. Fun side note, Lower Saxony is actually geographically situated further north than regular Saxony. Now let's jump into the... Because um, there are Saxony, uh, in German it's Sachsen, Sachsen-Anhalt and Niedersachsen, which is um, Saxony... I, I don't know how you say Sachsen-Anhalt. Um, it's in between that and Lower Saxony. But that Lower does not... Um, um, has nothing to do with the position on the map being more north. It's, um, if I remember correctly, it's uh, firstly because Saxony is a mountainous region um, and Lower Saxony isn't. There are not many mountains. Um, there are some hills, as, as we in, 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 my, in my home uh, would say. Um, but but no really mountains and I think it had something to do with um, the um, Saxons which um, traveled through there um, until they got to 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 British art but don't don't mark me on that I, I don't know but it's something like that it, it, it has nothing to do with the location on map that's what the whole point I wanted to make Lower Saxony is actually geographically situated further north than regular Saxony. Now let's jump into the fun stuff. Now we already discussed the Jungholz Quadrapoint and the Venbon Railway enclaves with Belgium and Austria. However, there's a few more. The entire town of Bussingen am Hochrhein is surrounded by Switzerland, whereas part of the Constance is cut off by the Rhine River and surrounded by Switzerland. However, immediately across the river, a small patch of empty land on the German side actually belongs to Switzerland. Finally, they split the island of Usedom with Poland in the north. Germany is interesting because every state in the country has its own distinct culture, dialect, history, food, traditions. I mean, Bavarians will be quite drastically different from Schwestlig Holsteiners. Yeah, when you when you go that far, um, that's true. Um, and yes, every state has its own customs and, and culture. But um, if you get, you have some states that are closer together, like um, North Rhine-Westphalia and Rhineland-Pfalz, um, which share most of the culture and history um due to them sharing the rhine river um which is their their most important uh, river there as well as um brandenburg and berlin and um hamburg and schleswig holstein and niedersachsen to to some or lower saxony to some regards and bremen are all have more or less um the same culture um which um, is one of the reasons why there are still attempts to unify them in some sorts. And actually, um, this whole northern region was, um, before Germany was united, it was the Holy Roman Empire, but there was some kind of unity before that with the Hanse, which started uh, mainly Lübeck, Hamburg and Lüneburg which are a city in Schleswig-Holstein, Hamburg and a city in Lower Saxony. 
and um, because that was a, a very important trade route there and um, all the um, well, most of the the sea axis and river axis points in northern Germany some kind of middle Germany and on along the Rhine um, were at some point in the Hanse and share um, a lot of the cultural values and culture um, because of that and uh, while Schleswig-Holstein is is um, largely also um, uh, um, influenced by by the Danish because it was Danish for a long 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 time like parts of today's Hamburg was were Danish at some point so and at some point I mean until pretty much recently um, so yeah history, food, traditions. I mean, Bavarians will be quite drastically different from Schleswig Holsteiners. Mecklenburg-Pommern will be different from Saarland. This all has to do with ancient and recent history. Basically, in the quickest way I can summarize this, Germanic tribes, Roman wars, Charlemagne, three kingdoms. This guy marries an Italian, creating a whole new mess called the Holy Roman Empire, made up of 300 smaller separate kingdoms, states, and dukedoms, which had nothing to do with Romans. Teutonic Knights, Brand Which... Um, the, the famous quote from Voltaire that the Holy Roman Empire is neither holy nor Roman nor an empire is quoted a lot, but factually partly wrong. Um, the Holy Roman Empire was founded um, via the um, or with help of the Pope who sat in Rome or the then um, church state and um, it was seen as the continuation of the Western Roman Empire. The Eastern Roman Empire was still a thing, um, it all only changed its name to, to uh, the Byzantine Empire or we changed the name to Byzantine Empire, um, but the Western Roman Empire was dissolved more or less and um, the Pope and uh, the Emperor um, starting with um, I think it was Otto um, Otto, the, uh, Otto the Great I think we call him here um, wanted to start this continu continuation because most of the ter territory in the Holy Roman Empire was at some point Roman um, except the parts that were uh, west of the um, Rhine, more or less, uh, east of the Rhine um, river. But um, yeah, so huh. that's the Roman part. The holy part is um, the, um, the Kaiser or um, Emperor was declared by the Pope. This, gun this whole investiture um, controversy thing um so the emperor was uh, at some kind or so to some degree um holy in in um, regards to the church because he was selected and crowned by the pope so he had his mandate from the pope which which had his mandate from god itself actually he had it from the emperor because the emperor declared the pope which circular division um, and um, the empire part is while there were a lot of states um, there was actually some kind of hierarchy so you had uh, kingdoms like the kingdom of Saxony the kingdom of Bavaria you had dukedoms you had bishopsies and so on and so on you had um, large regions you had smaller regions you had at some point thousands of regions who were um, uh, uh, governed by by um, some kind of of, of uh, guy so um, <clears throat> but on top of all of them was the Kaiser or um, the Emperor um, at least on paper um, because Ki the, the title Kaiser is a higher title than King. It is um, on the same uh, on the same page as like uh, the 
Shah in, in uh, the, the Islamic world. The Shah is the king of kings and the Kaiser also is the king of kings. Um, so um, at, at huge parts during the, the uh, history of the Holy, Holy Roman Empire, the, the Kaiser was um, uh, elected by, by an electoral college, um, which consists of um, uh, kings and dukes from, from those regions within the empire. Um, but yeah, he, he, it was some kind of an empire. Um, it had its its um, its region, its its whole mass, its empire. Um, it consists of various various states uh, within those uh, empire. But um, the 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 thing that that made it all complicated was that it was not a unified thing it was not a state like like uh, later uh, on france or england would be um it was not seen as a state but it was uh, more or less friendly and sometimes not friendly um uh, 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 compilation of german speaking and Italian speaking um, uh, smaller states and cities and stuff um, who agreed to at s to some degree work together and um, yeah it's 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 very 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 complicated but to say it was not not wholly Roman or an empire um, in itself is not entirely true um, and when Voltaire made that quote that was at a very very later state in the um, history of the empire where it might have been more true than at the beginnings and the um, high times which is all i wanted to say about this i just talk too much again empire made up of 300 smaller separate kingdoms states and dukedoms which had nothing to do with romans teutonic knights brandenburgs became prussia habsburgs became austrians lithuanians and poles made their own thing whereas the hungarians joined the austrians wars wars battles battles napoleon comes over and messes everything up and finally german nationalism surges and in 1871 otto von bismarck creates the first proto-german unified state and then they're all like oh dang we came late to this game we gotta scramble for some colonies and that's how all of these countries at one point spoke german oh and also keep in mind like 300 years before this a german banking company obtained colonial rights to venezuela for like 20 years they were looking for the lost city of el dorado so technically you can kind of say germans colonized the americas but it wasn't like a nationalized conquest thing fast forward even more and then you get world war one the monarchy ends treaty of versailles they lose land nazis come in world war ii germany splits in two for about 40 years and then finally we get the germany we have today east germany consisting of these states is um usually when uh in in german history um lessons when we talk about the um former um bundesländer um we also include east berlin which in itself was not a bundesland or a, a state um as it is today um but to to clarify that berlin was also partly um within the gdr um and uh yeah that's that's uh the 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 five that are always depicted but i just wanted to say that east berlin is also often uh, included there two for about 40 years and then finally okay cat um and another interesting thing the uh, the Saarland, which is uh, around here on that uh, little corner here was uh, not part of uh, west germany when it was formed in 1949 in the uh, verfassung uh, the, not the, the grundgesetz uh, which is kind of the um, constitution of uh, germany in german verfassung um it was mentioned that the um that the grundgesetz will also take effect when 
these um, eastern states will reunify with Germany and also if um, the Saarland joins them. It joined in a few years later, I guess it was. Um, I'm not very sure about it, but it joined later after in uh, 1949 the state was founded again. We get the Germany we have today. East Germany consisting of these states is to... Oh, and, and one last thing about that. Um, as you all know, um, or might know, Germany before World War I and even before World War II was larger than this. There were a whole lot of um, uh, area in uh, Poland, in today's Poland and in today's um, Russia with Kaliningrad. Um, and actually this stuff uh, at least the borders before the second world war but after the first world war where it was um, minimized um, were officially uh, still the borders of germany but um, in some kind of friendly uh, friendly agreement with the soviet union um, east germany um, at some point declared that they wouldn't um, yeah that they don't want that anymore that they would uh, give it to the Poles and um, then the uh, con a contract was set that um, the new border of Germany would be on the Oder um, instead of far out and uh, Kaliningrad would be Russian and Danzig uh, or Gdansk, Gdansk today uh, would be Polish and stuff um, and this was um, not really in the interest of West Germany but uh, one crucial part for the Soviets for the unification reunification in 1990 was that Germany would accept this um, new border as their border and uh, if, if Germany had said no we want also the the, the land that we uh, legally owned uh, beforehand um, then uh, German might not have been uh, reunified reunified just to add that today is still quite different from the rest of Germany as it was first occupied and influenced by the Soviet Union. They are generally not as well off economically as the rest of the country as you can still see the blocky Soviet style buildings sprawled throughout the regions. In fact the city of Berlin was split in half and the west side was actually an enclave of West Germany only accessible by train and highway. You can even see from a satellite image the divide. East Berlin still uses the yellowish tinted sulfur vapor light bulbs whereas the west still uses fluorescent and mercury arc white tinted light bulbs. Now the funny thing is although Berlin is the largest city in Germany the busiest airports are actually Frankfurt, Munich, Dusseldorf, with Berlin Tegel ranking at number four. Otherwise, some top notable landmarks and spots would be the Brandenburg Gate, the Valhalla. Which, um, with the um, airports, the things Berlin is the biggest um, city within Germany, but it's, as we just learned, uh, West Berlin was an uh, enclave in East Germany and East Berlin was East Germany and um, East Germany is more or less still today underdeveloped and um, especially when the borders opened a lot of people went west um, and, and wanted to, to um, search for the luck there, uh, the luck there. Um, so this is why Dusseldorf and Frankfurt both are not only in West Germany but near the um, the the uh, the center of of population because the um, the most people live in those areas while apart from Berlin outside of Berlin in Brandenburg um, there are I'm not really sure right now but I um, it might. Uh, be that Brandenburg has less or around the same uh, inhabitants as uh, Berlin itself. Um, I don't know, but it's far fewer than um, than North Rhine-Westphalia, Rhine-Pfalz and um, Hessen where um, these air busy airports are. And um, uh, that's why these are also the most busiest because Berlin airport has only more or less travel from and to Berlin itself while those airports have traveled to all the regions 
um, as well as um, international travels. When you want to fly from, like, let's say I live in Hamburg, which is a big city, but it's also surrounded by not that much inhabited um, uh, areas, um, more rural areas. And I want to fly to New York. Um, I most likely will have to take a train to Frankfurt or a plane to Frankfurt and fly from there because most of the international flights go from Frankfurt or Düsseldorf. Um, but I don't fly, so <clears throat> not a problem for me. Germany, the busiest airports are actually Frankfurt, Munich, Dusseldorf, with Berlin Tegel ranking at number four. Otherwise, some top notable landmarks and spots would be the Brandenburg Gate, the Valhalla, Cologne Cathedral, the Ulminster Church, the tallest in the world, the Berlin Victory Column, and hundreds and hundreds of castles all over. The most notable one probably being Neuschwanstein, the concept behind Disney's Cinderella Castle. Um, fun fact. Something that even Germans sometimes uh, do not know, but Neuschwanstein is not a medieval castle. It's not. Um, it's it's not even a Renaissance castle or something. It was built in the 19th um, century, um, and I guess wouldn't even repel any attack if some some medieval force would uh, try to do so. Um, and it, it was just built to to be romantic and beautiful, uh, which it is, in fact. But it, it was not uh, uh, medieval. Germany also has over 400 zoos, more than any other country in the world. And of course, everybody knows about the Autobahn, the highway system in which if you see this sign, it means there's no speed limit. And it's like that for a huge portion of the roadway. And no wonder, considering how vast and wide those cultivated countrysides can get. Time for level two. Okay, think of it this way. In Germany, the more down you go, the more up you move. Basically, Germany lies on the Atlantic Shelf in the north that starts with the mudflats in the North Sea. Seriously, this island right here is accessible only Which, um, actually... Shelf in the north that starts with the mudflats in the North Sea. Seriously... This island here, no uh, Neuwerk, Neuwerk, um, actually is a part of Hamburg. Um, Despite being uh, in the North Sea or in the in the Wattenmeer, um, this whole area around it is the uh, Hamburgish, Hamburgische Nationalpark Wattenmeer. Um, I don't remember how it came to be that uh, this island uh, became a part of Hamburg, but I guess because it's near the um, routes ships take uh, to, to get into the Elbe um, to go to Hamburg, um they had here um their their um lighthouse and and just they from here they could inform uh hamburg of um, arriving ships and guide them into i don't know um but yes this this uh, island is a part of hamburg and um despite being uh like what 200 300 kilometers away from hamburg um yeah this island right here is accessible only for a few hours by foot until the tide comes and floods everything. Then everything just kind of creeps up into the Alps in the south by Bavaria and Baden-Württemberg, with the highest mountain, Zugspitze, located right along the border with Austria. Kind of like France, Germany is filled with a vast irrigating network of rivers like the Spree, Elbe, Vesa, Rhine, and of course the mighty Danube that starts here. About a third of the land is arable and another third is woodland, and after a millennia of civilization, Germans have cultivated the crap out of their country. Most agriculture, of course, happens in the north flat plains and the central regions of the country, which is, by the way, kind of like Europe's tornado alley, due to its position sandwiched between the Arctic blasts of Scandinavia and the moist, warm jet streams of the Mediterranean below. But don't don't picture it like those tornadoes uh, or hurricanes you have in, in the US or, or um, in the Caribbean Sea. Um, the most tornadoes in Germany go more or less unnoticed um, without heavy damage and without uh, casualties usually there are exceptions but usually it's it's more or less it's it's okay so Germany can be an atmospheric war zone in the summer. There are more tornadoes on average in Germany than any other country in Europe. Speaking of flat farmland, Germany is the world's largest rye and hop producer. Germans absolutely freaking lutely love their bread. There are over 300 different kinds of bread in the country, more types than any other country in the world, and almost every meal incorporates some kind of slice or small bun or... Um, 
The buns um, are called Brötchen. Um, I like to call them in English breadlings uh, because it's it's uh, it, it, there are bread rolls uh, as you would say in English, but um, it, it's not quite the same. This um, as a German myself, I, um, I I am guilty of this. I take this very seriously um, and bread rolls um, what what you in, in America or in Britain or everywhere else in the wo world would uh, imagine as a bread roll is not what a brötchen is or breadling as I call them um, and they come in various f shapes and sizes uh, like you see here um, for example you have here a, a mohnbrötchen uh, this looks bit like a rye or a, or a vollkorn brötchen of uh, uh, i don't know how you would say in english uh, full 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 corn um this is a laugen brötchen i think uh, this is a sesam brötchen uh, this is a schrippe or a kaiser brötchen or whatever um, and so on and so on and um, they are very very important for us and i heard from a lot of people who went abroad like to the us or to japan or to um, other parts of the world and the first thing they miss is the bread because the except in germany apparently uh, the bread everywhere is not as good as, uh, and the varieties is, are just not there. Um, there are a lot of German bakeries um, in the US just for those people um, to feel a little bit more home. And um, there are um, people who, who actually go to the US uh, to open up such bakeries in, in uh, 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 cities like Los Angeles, for example. And there were a documentation in, in television uh, a few years back about uh, such people. And um, but yeah, we, we take that uh, uh, very seriously. And um, it is it is some kind of art to to make good bread and breadlings. In any other country in the world and almost every meal incorporates some kind of slice or small bun or brötchen of bread. Hast du gluten free? Nein! Germans are heavy meat eaters, specifically in pork. They basically know every possible way to cook a pig. Over 50 different types of sausage exist alongside schnitzels, rouladen, sour bread. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, uh, that's too far. Way to cook a pig. Um, schnitzel first is not German, it's Austrian. Um, at least the uh, Wiener Schnitzel is especially not pork. It's not. It's not pig. It's um, Kalb's Schnitzel. It's. It's. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Kalf. You say in in English. Um, and they're very particular. Um, the the Schnitzel you can buy here if they are cheap and made to be cheap then yes they are um, of pig or sometimes even of chicken but a real um, Vienna schnitzel is um, from Kalf and it's very delicious and I love Kalf schnitzel and I'm very happy that there is a delivery service near me who actually makes Kalf schnitzel um, whereas all other delivery services and when you go to the supermarket here in Hamburg um, you mostly find chicken or um, pig. Over 50 different types of sausage exist alongside schnitzels, rouladen, sauerbraten, schwein... And rouladen, um, there are two very different types of rouladen. There are the um, rinder roulade, which is um, cow... Uh, you know, cow meat, uh, which is... Um, you have... For example, uh, a pickle, and um, you take a slice of that pickle, and then you roll um, um, uh, the the meat around it, and then you um, cook it in in sauce, or you you uh, roast it like how you want it to have. And then there is the uh, kohl roulade, which is the opposite way. You have some um, hackfleisch, as we call it, which is uh, 
wolf meat. I don't know how you say it in English. I, I have to learn my vocabulary for that. Um, but uh, that is um, wrapped in with um, coal. Um, and I don't mean cold slaw coal, but um, uh, cabbage coal, I think it is. I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not that good of a cook and I never made uh, one of those roulades, roulades myself. But uh, these are the main two types. And Schweinshaxe, as we see it here, is uh, more southern food, which uh, you find mostly like Eisbein in Bavaria, uh, whereas in, uh, in northern Germany, uh, it's, it's less common, let's say so. It is, uh, you, you can eat it here, you can find it here, but it is less common, and that's close. Um, it's, it's, uh, some kind of um, mashed po smashed potato uh, rolled into uh, this and then cooked in water. It, this is full of water. And at a big party, you might find Spanfackel. Beer reigns supreme all over as the third largest consumers of beer after the Czech Republic. Even their president has no problem with public intoxication. And Austria. Germany is world renowned for their beer, which, by the way, follows the Reinheitsgebot rule in which they are only allowed to use water, hops, malt, and sometimes yeast. None yeah, the Reinheitsgebot is, uh, in, in terms of beer, what Germany is most known for. Um, actually, the oldest breweries um, are all German as far as I know, um, especially for ale. Do you say ale in, in English? We, we say Pils, which comes from Pilsen, which was German at the time when um, beer was brewed there. Uh, the Reinheitsgebot is from the King of Bavaria. Once again, talking about ki Kingdom of Bavaria, which was its own state in some form um and uh yes said um, uh, that only those ingredients can be in beer um it's so beer today is brewed only that way um however it is not forbidden to to mix it up afterwards so you can mix beer with um uh, lemonade uh, for example to get an uh uh, uh, a mixed uh, drink which is called depending on where you are Radler or Alsterwasser in northern Germany it's mostly Alsterwasser because we have the Alster which is the big uh, lake within Hamburg um, and the river um, that uh, also floats into that lake and um, but yeah you only uh, all beer in Germany is brewed that way and that's one of the um, reasons why we don't usually don't like imported um, beer or beer abroad um, because let's be honest they don't taste good compared at least in my experience i sometimes i i drink my fair share of guinness or um, kilkenny or I even tried a Heineken or a, an American beer sometimes, but nothing, not, it's nothing compared to real, um, real pills. And even some beers in Germany are not that good, like, like Alt or, or um, what, what they drink in Cologne, um, Kölsch, Kölsch, uh, but um, pills and, and Weissbier, which is all, again, Bavaria, um, are okay. The rest is meh. Eh. Nonetheless, about 1,300 breweries exist, pumping out over 5,000 brands. The oldest continuously existing brewery in the world, started by Benedictine monks in 1040 AD, can be found here. Germany takes the environment very seriously and for the past two decades has been going on a major green revolution. As of today, they have the largest installed solar power capacity and green infrastructure practices like home installed turbines and solar panels have seen a huge surge in the past 10 years. Forests dominate the southern regions where the landscape gets hillier and mountainous, the most famous one being the Black Forest or the Schwarzwald in Baden-Württemberg. Deer, bears, boar, foxes, badgers, and the national animal, the eagle, can be found thriving in these parts. Nonetheless, economically, Germany is known mostly for their exceptional engineering and industry production. Companies we've all heard of, like Volkswagen, BMW, Mercedes-Benz, Porsche, Audi, Telecom, Nivea, DHL, Bosch, Adidas, Puma, Adidas. Um, Adolf Dasser, the founder of um, Adidas, and the founder of Puma, whose name I forgot, um if i remember correctly they were brothers and um 
this is uh, actually not how how it's in in Germany. It's 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 there's no fight between Adidas and Puma wearers. Uh, most people wear um, Nike, though. <laughs> Oh, no! Yeah, it's kind of like the whole biscoito bolacha thing from Brazil. Remember? Well, we have mud flats, tornadoes, pork, beer, mountains. All that's missing is people. Level three. Fun little side note, in Germany, this is three, not this. Now, if the EU was a family, Germany would kind of be like the dad who got out of rehab, reconciled with his wife and kids, and is taking his new life very seriously as he is haunted by the demons of his past every day. First of all, the country has about 82 million people and is the most populated in the EU, second most in Europe after Russia. And um uh, 83 it's it's uh officially uh, i think now and um, the video is from 2017 i think we reached 83 last year or something um so yeah and has the fourth largest nominal GDP in the world. About 80% of the country identifies as ethnically German, 12% other Europeans, mostly Polish, Italian, Dutch, and so on. Turks make up about 3.5%, Asians at 2%, and the rest are made up of other groups like Africans and Americans. Also, they use the Euro, they use the C and F type outlets, and they drive on the right side of the road. Germany is without a doubt a global powerhouse. It is the strongest economy in the EU and makes up about 16% of the union's population. It's the third largest exporter and importer of goods in the world. After the United States, Germany is also the second most popular global migration destination germany experiences a high standard of living yeah um the reason being is um when you're living in a poor country and um or in a war torn country or something like that and you have you have your dreams you have your dreams of of a country where everyone is free where you can make money yada 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 like america was um for the the immigrants in the 19th uh, century century um and it is most likely that when you are from around europe the first destination you have heard of is germany because it is the largest power uh, 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 the richest country more or less in um in in europe and um one of the the uh, most attractive to 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 those people like the us is for especially americans like mexicans and southern americans um because let's be honest if you are from africa or from syria etc pp um then it's not very likely that you would make it to america so you will you want to make it to to the best possible place in your reach which is germany um or for some um scandinavia because scandinavia actually is in in a lot of regards um has higher living standards than, than Germany, but they also have higher um, uh, immigration politics standards. So it's Germany is like the 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 best compromise um, you can hope for if you are in, in in such a situation and looking for the best possible destination. That's why Germany is um, yeah the the location number one for everyone to go in and around Europe and America in and around um, America. And I think most of the people who go to Germany would also like to go to US, but can't because expensive or very dangerous because if you do that in a, in a, a gummy boat, then have fun. Also, the second most popular global migration destination. Germany experiences a high standard of living, tuition free universities, if you get accepted, that is, a mostly government subsidized universal healthcare system, about a quarter is still privatized, and state pension for retirement at age 65. Now, when it comes to language, things get a little tricky. Each state kind of has their own type of German. However, to get by, most Germans learn how to speak Hochdeutsch or High German, which is the standard dialect. The European Charter, however, protects the minority languages of Frisian, Danish, Romani, Sorbian, which is like a Slavic based language used along the Czech Polish border and Plattdeutsch or Low German which has similarities to Dutch and is typically used by the Amish and Mennonite communities across the world. Uh, Plattdeutsch um, actually is um, for some considered to be the um, so, you know English is a Germanic language um, it evolved from German and um, 
you can see it um, when uh, when you hear someone speaking Plattdeutsch. Uh, you can kind of hear it, especially when you go back to um, the uh, Celtic times in um, in in, in uh, Great Britain, especially in England, uh, before um, uh, the Battle of Hastings, before uh, the uh, William the Bastard came along. Uh, or William the Conqueror now and uh, installed himself as king um, and changed um, the dialect to be a more Norman um, English. Um, when you go back to and read sources from that time, uh, as a German, you actually can sometimes understand what is written uh, because it's s very similar to German at that stage. Um, and uh, especially similar to, to uh, Plattdeutsch, which is uh, mostly spoken in uh, northern Germany, especially Hamburg and Schleswig-Holstein, um, not so much in, the, uh, in, in, in this area here around uh, Cuxhaven, Bremerhaven um, and so on, because this is uh, more Frisian, like here as well is more Frisian. Uh, Plattdeutsch is more for uh, this parts here, but it's, yeah, we win some noodles. Low German, which has similarities to Dutch and is typically used by the Amish and Mennonite communities across the world. In terms of regional distinctions though, Germany is kind of divided into five cultural areas. Rhineland, East and Middle Deutschland, North Deutschland, Baden-Württemberg and Bavaria. Rhineland is on the west side and has a culture somewhat more influenced by France, more Catholics, Carnival celebrations are huge out here. East and Middle Germany was the part that used to be its own country for 40 years as it was influenced by the Soviets. Sorbians can also be found here too. Northern Germany has a coastal sea culture. Yeah, that's uh, actually. As it was influenced by the Soviets. Soviets yeah. can also be found here too. Northern. This is actually the uh, Hamburg Harbor. This is a Landungsbrücken. Um, you can see the the old tunnel. Uh, this is uh, Plom and Foss here, um, and all this part here is, uh, funnily enough. The the biggest part of Hamburg is south of the um, Elbe. Well, a very huge part of Hamburg is south of the Elbe, and uh, a very huge part of that is um, the harbor alone. Um, and yeah, just wanted to say that. Germany has a coastal sea culture that identifies closer with Denmark and the Netherlands. They are also known for being kind of quiet and reserved. Baden-Württemberg has an interesting Swabian culture where they speak a dialect so thick that only about 40% of it is intelligible to other Germans. Which is true. Um, before, uh, I, uh, at some point I worked uh, for one and a half years as a, a support agent uh, for, for telephone support for a mail delivery com company, uh, the second largest in Germany. And um, some customers, you, you, have, you have customers calling in from all around Germany, Austria and Switzerland, and sometimes even from, from, uh, from, from elsewhere, like um, people who speak English. And there are two dialects who, who I always, have problems understanding and I'm, I'm i'm very proud of of being able to understand most of um, dialects spoken in germany because i kind of uh, grew up with two languages if you want so because my family spoke um, saxon and uh, all around me they spoke um, hamburger platt uh, which is uh, hamburgerisch is is not really plattdeutsch but they they kind of pretend to have this still Plattdeutsch is, 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 a, is a language that is um, dying slowly um, but Hamburgerisch and Saxon are um, pretty pretty different um, and uh, not Hamburgerisch so much but uh, both are very different from Hochdeutsch um, and uh, so because of that, I was uh, I'm, I'm able to understand Bavarian. I'm I'm able to understand um, the Rhenish uh, dialects, but the the Swabian dialect I I have huge problems. The Swabian dialect and um, African English are the two dialects 
I will never understand if if they speak fast, which is all I wanted to say about this. Swabian culture, where they speak a dialect so thick that only about 40% of it is intelligible to other Germans. And then you have Bavaria, which is where the Americanized, perpetuated stereotypes about Germany came from with Lederhosen, Dirndls, Half Timber, Beer Houses, and Cuckoo Clocks. For the record, Germans are sick of those stereotypes. It's like saying all Americans are cowboys with guns and horses. Speaking of stereotypes, some of the stereotypes in Germany include things like Saxons being very indecisive, Berliners are always bragging about themselves, Swabians are stingy, Bavarians drank too much, Hessians talk too much, Holsteiners don't talk enough, and so on. Words differ from regions too. For example, in High German, you would say Auf Wiedersehen, but in Bavarian, you would say Fiat die Gott. Actually, in, in, in Northern Germany, we just say what here, uh, what they write here now, it's uh, Tschüss. Um, there's, there's actually a song um, called In Hamburg sagt man Tschüss. Uh, in English, uh, it was in, in Hamburg, you say Tschüss. Um, which means uh, goodbye, which is how the text it goes in Hamburg. Sagt man tschüss, das heißt auf Wiedersehen. Um, and um, yeah, we also say ciao, like like in Italy, because it's it's fancier. <laughs> um, not so much auf Wiedersehen, um, but it's it's depending on how old you are and what in what um, group you are and uh, who the recipient is uh, you're talking with and uh, one thing about the stereotypes i did not um, post there or say something because i i don't know most of the um, stereotypes um the stereotypes i come across are just like hamburg and um, schleswig-holstein that like you just said we were cold and um very very um pragmatic while bavarians are um not not very drunk i i don't know if i even have any stereotype about a bavarian except from all those stereotypes that everyone has about the germans like lederhosen and stuff um just just that and please don't be offended but um, the Bavarian dialect is a very thick dialect and Bavarian culture, Bavarian people mostly are very rural. So they're, they're in agriculture, they're in forest culture and uh, uh, culture. And um, so I'm always depicting when, when I imagine a, a people from Bavaria, I'm depicting a kind of old, fat, um, but muscular um, man like 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 a woodcutter um, or a farmer who is uh, not that intelligent and and always um, sp speaks very thick but I, I don't know it's it's that's all I came up with. Too. For example, in High German, you would say Auf Wiedersehen. But in Bavarian, you would say Fiat die Gott. In Kölsch, you would say Tschüss. And in Rhineland, you might say Ayus. And there's so many compound words to get really long and complicated, like Rindfleischer, Ticketierungsüberwachungsaufgaben, Übertragungsgesetz. This is because many words are... I, um, actually, when I was younger, I tried to come up with, with the longest word ever. And in my eyes, I succeeded because my word was three pages long um, and I won't uh, recite it now and I don't remember it in full, but um, he will now explain why this is so, so I'll just let him explain. This is because many words are mehrdeutig or M. Mehrdeutig, not mehrdrutig. This is not what I, what I was uh, um, uh, referring to. No, it's not because the uh, the words are ambiguous, at least not entirely because of that. It's um, because the German language is predestined to to just build um, so called coffer words, which is um, I, I forgot the the English word for coffer. Uh, where you package luggage luggage words um, you can just 
in in English you would uh, use a, a hyphen, for example, you would um, just use a space or something. But in in German you can almost everything um, you want to to write together you can write together with just a few added um, uh, just a few added. Uh, 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 Buchstaben. Uh, it's late. It's like, like almost 5 p uh, a.m. right now. Um, letters. Oh my god. Um, complicated, like print, Fleischer, Ticketierungsüberwachung auf. Uh, in, in this case, it's uh, Rindfleisch is one word, Etikettierungs, and this S. Because you have this S, you now can uh, took these Überwachungs, another S, Aufgaben, and you can put a hyphen here, or Aufgaben über you have another word with an S. So this S uh, makes it possible to be for this thing to be one word. You could also just um, use hyphens. Übertragungsgesetz. <coughs> This is because many words are merthudig or ambiguous words that are kind of elongated to give off an extensive meaning. Germans have very vivid imaginations and make up words for everything. Like my favorite word, Backpfeifengesicht. Not this time. By the way, for the record, this letter makes a double S sound. However, spelling reformers have tried to decrease the usage of this letter in recent years, which has led to some protests. Germans also love dubbing everything from foreign media into German. Some like this, some don't, but either way, it's here to stay. About I usually... When I was younger, I I was indifferent, but now I don't like it because I'm very fixated on on mouth movement, and if it don't add up, it's I I, I get crazy, and uh, that's why I usually prefer now to watch things in the original language if possible, um, and uh, which is mostly English. But um, yeah, um, in recent years, the dubbing community um, has a bit um, lessened in, in terms of um, in the 90s and before that, everything was to be um, translated. Everything within a film or TV series, as well as the title, as well as in some cases, even all the names of the people in it um, were Germanized. Um, which, um, whereas today you usually have still the English names, you usually still have the English title, um, sometimes with um, an added subtitle for uh, uh, in German, but it's okay. Um, you usually even have puns or specific words um, still in the uh, in the original version and even like uh, grunts or stuff like that what which are not words aren't even dubbed anymore to, um, and and just kept the original sound um, however this led to to some very interesting decisions in the past like um, the f movie uh, Captain America Civil War or uh, The Winter Soldier um, that's the name you use everywhere around the world except in Germany we did not translate this in Germany we say the first Avenger Civil War or the first Avenger Winter Soldier because the first Avenger is somehow better than Captain America It, even if it's still English or the film um, The Huntsman The Winter War uh, I think you call it in English in German is it The Huntsman and the Snow Queen which is still English but still a completely different title I, I don't know why it's stupid 
60% of the country identifies at least nominally as Christians, split between Protestants and Catholics. Germany was even the birthplace of the Protestant Reformation, split from the Catholic Church by Martin Luther. Otherwise, the rest are mostly agnostic or irreligious, with a noticeable community of Muslims, mostly from the huge Turkish and Middle Eastern communities, at about 5%, as well as a few Jews, Buddhists, and Hindus rounding up the remainder 1%. To kind of get a feel of what it's like to be German, you kind of have to understand where they've come from. After World War II, they kind of had a lot of work to do. However, it wasn't until the mid 50s. Uh, that's written wrong. Um, Wirtschaftswunder. It, it, it's okay. come from. After World War II, they kind of had. Oh, um, this depiction here um, is from a soccer match. You will most likely never see anyone um, in Germany um, like wave a German flag or something because we are very, very cautious with patriotism. Uh, because patriotism led to the Second World War and the Third Reich. Um, why do I say Reich? I'm German, I can say Reich. <laughs> and um, so it's not forbidden. And in recent years, since the fo uh, so yeah, football we are, soccer we are, as you, you call it what you want, um, I, say, I just say Fußball VM. Since since uh, the Fußball VM in uh, Germany in two, uh, 2006, the um, usage of uh, the 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 patriotism has raised a bit. It's not that frowned upon today to wave a German flag, and you can even show it in windows. And some have um, have still little flags on their cars, um, but mostly it's it's very very um yeah you you just don't do it you you you're not used to it and you have you you're, you're a bit afraid of of being um being looked weirdly at because you do it and uh you don't want to be called a nazi uh except you are a nazi but even then you might not want to be called one um but yeah, this this uh, in in that uh, form it only happens at football matches. Get a feel of what it's like to be German. You kind of have to understand where they've come from. After World War II, they kind of had a lot of work to do. However, it wasn't until the mid '50s and early '60s that the Wirtschaftswunder or economic wonder happened, to which almost everybody got to work. Basically, this guy envisioned and implemented a social market economy combined with free market capitalism alongside socialist policies that established fair competition in a welfare state. GDP increased. We call that soziale Marktwirtschaft, social market economy <laughs> some kind of, uh, of that capitalism alongside socialist policies that established fair competition in a welfare state gdp increased by 80 percent investments by 120 percent labor forces were utilized to the maximum things started to get better in germany all children are corralled into general public schools until age 10 when they are given the option to enroll in three different types of middle schools gymnasium geared towards focusing on higher linguistic mathematic and science fields for universities Realschule, a middle ground type of school and Hauptschule, a school that is geared towards helping kids that seem to show promise in specific Specific vocation or trades. There are all um, uh, actually more than these um, three school types. Um, the uh, degrees um, that you can get um, are um, um, Abitur, which is uh, Matura in, in, in Austria, or um, I, I have no clue how you call it in. Uh, in English, um, but it's the highest school level degree that you can have, um, which grants you the access to go to um, university. Um, you have the Realschulabschluss, um, which is the uh, which you need to um, try to get your Abitur uh, via uh, via a second um, school. So. After, after fourth grade, you are split into Hauptschule, Realschule or Gymnasium. When you go to um, Gymnasium, you can just go through and make your Abitur. If you go to Realschule, you can go through and then make your Abitur with um, three years on top of that, if you have a good degree um, on that. If you go to the Hauptschule, you basically have uh, to go to school one year less and that's it. 
can after that go to another school to uh, try to get your Realschulabschluss and then your Abitur. But um, it's, <coughs> yeah, like you said, trade oriented. There's also a school form which combines Haupt- und Realschule, which is the uh, Gesamtschule, uh, which um, also has some elements of the um, gymnasium. Um, you you uh, can go there from fifth to 13th grade, 13th grade being the one you need to um, have Abitur, 10th grade is for Realschule, 9th grade is for Hauptschule. Um, you have uh, tests you have to, to pass to um, proceed after um, the ninth uh, um, uh, grade, but um, you can have, you, you can reach all available degrees on that school alone. Then there is a Waldorf Schule, um, which is a special form of school with more, um, where they're more concentrated on the elements, on, on uh, being in the nature and they are often get fun uh, made uh, uh, on them because uh, like they learn how to dance their own names um, <coughs> and lastly there is um, the Sonderschule or special school for you guessed it special people um, but uh, yeah the the uh, main um, roads you can go after fourth grade are Realschule, Hauptschule, Gesamtschule or Gymnasium. Germany also has the largest music market in the EU and the third in the world after the US and Japan. They love preserving their heritage and culture through music and art. In fact, there are around 130 national orchestras mostly supported by public money and artists get a 50% reduction in health insurance through a special type of offer in the legal system. One thing that still kind of supposedly maintains itself in Germany is the mindset of Vergangenheitsbewältigung. Totally butchered that! Which kind of translates to a lingering sense of guilt from the past. Germans have reportedly some of the lowest levels of national pride and unless if you're at at a soccer game, chances are you will almost never see anyone holding a German flag or waving it in any kind of like patriotic setting. It's weird, but it's kind of how things are. You monster! They it's also um, in the US, at least when, when I see it in, in TV uh, and stuff, allegedly you um, every morning you, you stand up in, in your school or something and pledge allegiance to the flag and uh, sing stars and stripes forever or something and um, this level of patriotism would raise all the red flags in Germany um, if, if someone would stand up uh, take a German flag and just sing the national anthem uh, everyone would stare at that person uh, with even with disgust um, except it's on a sport event or um, something like that or some except there is a good reason for it but just especially in schools uh, we don't have this, this uh, things we don't pledge allegiance to the flag or to the country or something and um, Actually, most people I know don't even know the lyrics of the national anthem and only know the text through uh, sport events, uh, the, the melody through sport events. And um, uh, sometimes the text through sport events, because when everyone sings it, you just sing with um, them. Uh, there was, uh, funnily, there was some uh, at some point um, a German pop singer, um, Sarah Connor, not related to the one from Terminator, um, had to sing the German national anthem uh, anthem at an event. I don't remember the event, but um, I thought it was a soccer match. It might have been uh, at the at the World Championship, um, and she messed up the text. Shit happens, but. Um, no one got mad at her. It was funny, but <coughs> no one got mad. At a soccer game, chances are you will almost never see anyone holding a German flag or waving it in any kind of like patriotic setting. It's weird, but it's kind of how things are. You monster. They've made yeah, great strides like to move that. on from the past. Nazi flags and Mein Kampf are incredibly illegal items to own in Germany. And they even have a rule, the Volkswertzung. Um, 
Nazi symbols, yes, they are illegal. Um, it is not illegal to own Mein Kampf. Um, it is illegal to sell it. Is it? Ill it is illegal to, to like, um, uh, gain, uh, 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 let everyone else have access to it. Um, but you can legally own it, as far as I know. There is. Um, um, there is a, um, a comedian, more or less, um, a critical satir 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 satirism person, <laughs> um, who's called um, Sera Somunchu, who is originally not from Germany, as the name suggests, uh, but who lives here, who uh, works here, and who is um, reading from Mein Kampf in, in some of his um, shows. Um, in a critical sense, not not preaching it in a critical sense. Um, and as far as I know, he wasn't arrested for it. Um, so owning my Kampf, reading it, it's not illegal. Uh, preaching it in a in a not um, um, not healthy way, let's say so, um, not in, a, in an educating way, uh, that's illegal. And everything regarding swastikas and other um, Symbolicas from the um, Nazis' uh, time. That's highly illegal. That's true. Flags and Mein Kampf are incredibly illegal items to own in Germany. And they even have a rule, the Volkswertzung, which basically says you cannot talk trash by denying the past atrocities. Some people say this infringes on free speech. Others say it's good because it solidifies truth. Other uh, in terms of uh, free speech, um, it is it is free speech in Germany is limited and uh, it is limited by our constitution you we have free speech as long as we do not um, uh, diminish or interfere with other um, basic rights every human being has so it, it is it, let's say i want to um, i want to talk trash about someone then that is not free speech if I insult this person, because that insult um, does violate the right of this other person um, to be uh, untouched. Uh, uh, that sounds very wrong. Um, the, the, the first article um, of the German constitution is Die Würde des Menschen ist unantastbar, which uh, translates to the whatever würde means let me let me just take a look um ah dignity yes the dignity of uh, the human is untouchable and when i um, insult you then this touches your dignity and therefore is not protected by free speech and uh, the, the same goes for Volksverhetzung or um, denying the Holocaust, which also is not free speech. Um, flat Earth and stuff like that is, is not that common here because um, this does not fall under free speech. Um, at least not in the way it would in the US where the uh, rules are more lenient. Otherwise, some notable Germans throughout history include Charlemagne, although he was a Frank, but eh, I guess it kind of counts. Albrecht, Dürer, David Friedrich, Gutenberg, Bach, Beethoven, Karl Benz, Albert Einstein, although Americans would like to claim that he moved to the US and became an American. Johannes Kepler, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, Friedrich Schiller, Michael Schumacher, Alex von Humboldt, and of course Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels co-founded Marxism. <coughs> but one thing Germans do best would have to be diplomacy. To this day, the German passport holds the most visa-free nations anymore. out of any other country in the world just beating Sweden therefore you can kind of conclude that Germany kind of knows how to relate to people let's find out how in the final round level four 
Germany knows how to make friends. They have over 220 diplomatic missions abroad and over 350 honorary consuls and have an incredibly high position of authority in the EU. Their closest African friend would probably be Namibia. As a former German colony way back in the 19th century, Namibia held on relations and to this day, German is still a recognized language in Namibia. Germans have been supporting and sharing ties both economically and ideologically for over a century. India and South Korea are really close friends in Asia. India supported both East and West Germany during the Cold War and after reunification, they were like, Woohoo! Even better! And Germany is to South Korea what Japan is to France. They love to piggyback off of each other's ideas and cultures, especially in the automotive industry. Many South Koreans were sent to Germany after the Korean War to work abroad and study, and Germans have been growing in fascination with visiting South Korea. The U.S. is probably the closest ally outside of the EU. About 30% of Americans claim German heritage, and after World War II, the Marshall Plan allowed the U.S. to give post-war aid to Germany, which helped kickstart the economic recovery. Germany was a key figure in the formation of the State of Israel after World World War II, which after the Holocaust left an obligation to invest in the building up of a Jewish community. Turkey is probably the closest Middle Eastern ally. At Germany was one of the main reasons for Israel as well. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not sh I, I actually don't know um, how the the um, people from from Israel and, and Jews uh, view Germany today. Um, but I could at least imagine that they're not all happy and friends and such. Obligation to invest in the building up of a Jewish community. Turkey is probably the closest Middle Eastern ally as the Turks make up the largest Asian demographic in Germany, although many of them may or may not also identify as Kurds. But since Kurds don't have a state of their own, they usually go under Turkish passports when immigrating and are documented as such. Their best friends, however, would probably be literally all their neighbors. The thing is, Germany is kind of like Bosnia and Herzegovina in which, by default, they kind of get friends based off of the regional alliances. Bavarians get along with Austrians, Baden-Württembergs get along with Switzerland, East Germany has good relations with the Slavic countries, the Rhine states love Belgium, Luxembourg, and France, and the north side loves the Netherlands and Denmark. France, though, is kind of like the trophy wife of Germany, as the two have had an angry start, but then eventually fell in love and worked together beautifully. France is like the beautiful, flashy spokesperson for the EU that stands in the spotlight as Germany stands in the background, managing all the money and logistical work. In conclusion, although Germanic peoples have existed for thousands of years, an actual unified German state didn't appear until kind of recently, and the brief time that they've been around, they've kind of gone through some of the most intense, world revolutionizing historical events possibly imagined. Yet, they've come out working hard and building their way up to become a world superpower. You gotta give it to them. There's something about the Germans. And with that, final boss level complete. Stay tuned, another African state Germany has ties to, Ghana, is coming up next. Yeah, that's uh, when, when you said, uh, uh, spoke from Namibia, I just wanted to say that most um, African people I know of in Germany and I know personally, are from uh, Ghana or Togo, um, which Ghana and Togo were combined as Togoland, uh, if I remember correctly. And um, yeah, that's uh, probably why they are here. Um, and yeah, that's that's that was the video. Um, I hope you learned uh, something. Um, I hope I could maybe give you some insight in, in some degree. Um, as always, I, I don't claim to know everything. I don't claim that uh, everything I said was right. Um, I'm, I'm in fact pretty sure that some of the stuff I said was bullshit. Um, but uh, that's how knowledge works, I guess. That's how learning works. And um, with that, I would say uh, we finished this video. Uh, just let's wrap it up. Uh, if you liked it, um, if you like the format, if you like how we do it, um, then uh, please comment. If you don't like it, please comment as well. Um, if you like the video, please uh, like and subscribe. If you don't like, please dislike and not subscribe um, as well. Uh, support uh, the uh, channel uh, from uh, Geography Now. Link to the video will be in the uh, description. And uh, yeah, support them and uh, let's all be happy together. And yes, uh, what else to say? Um, except uh, stay tuned for the next video, uh, which will be finally have maybe another. Uh, clothing with me because I recorded three videos this night and uh, now I'm going to bed and with that have a nice night bye bye